So a house that is unstaged versus a house that is staged, how does that impact for you guys on values and stuff? None. None at all. None? <laughs> So guys, I'm so happy you guys are here with us today. Um, I know the appraisal topic is a topic that um, in our industry, in the real estate industry, we're always just, it's like a mystery, right? Um, so it's so nice that you guys are so willing to come on here and share your expertise so that the consumer can understand your role, the realtors can understand their role, and um, just try to figure out how we can better work together so that we can set each other up for success. Because at the end of the day, our economy needs houses to move because we all know that housing is like the leading indicator, which for economic fabulousness, if the housing market is down, people get nervous. If the housing market is up, people are feeling more optimistic and you guys play this amazing balance of keeping um, things on trend and adjusting and looking at the market and just seeing what's going on. All right. I want to get right into it. What is the biggest challenge? And I want to talk specifically with uh, residential real estate specifically and more of your conventional FHA, the everyday appraisals. Okay. What is the, like the biggest avoidable hang up? Data. Like data. We need data and MLS is our data source. So our biggest hang up is incorrect or incomplete data in the MLS. Therefore we can't measure the market if we don't know what's happening in it. So if the, Agents aren't putting data in the MLS correctly or most correctly, not telling us the story, then we just don't know how to measure it. So I've been serving on MLS board in Corpus for six years because I'm trying to help them understand that we need to work together and this is our tool. So we've, we've come a long way and, and that's helped with the understanding too. Would you agree, Josh, data, or you have a different one? Uh, data is definitely a big one. I've seen a lot of incorrect data put into uh, MLS systems. I've seen basements included in the overall gross living area. And so I'd say one the biggest hangups is that there's an inconsistency between what the GSEs require or basically what uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie, Mae, Freddie Mac require for us to measure properties and how uh, agents see it because they're trying to sell it to the public. However, we have a specific way we have to appraise things through the government and what they require us to do. Um, the other hangups I see from my side being on the, the bank industry is one, agents not being familiar with the uh, minimum property requirements, whether it's VA or FHA. And so we'll see a lot of hangups there where they will try and do an FHA um, offer on a property that has all kinds of issues that will not go. And so that causes a whole bunch of heartache. And then the second one I see is, and this is a consistent theme, is where a lot of agents use the price per square foot method and not understanding what is within that price per square foot and what it entails. Um, so we see a lot of agents adjusting by that price per square foot, which includes your garage contributory value. If there's a pool, it includes that as a contributory value and even the land. And that's really, really bad whenever the land is in, uh, you know, University Park or Highland Park in the DFW area. And that land goes for $300 a square foot. Uh, so um, you can easily over adjust and under adjust using that number. So what I've found historically, and tell me if this is true, because I, I hear, I do, you're right. I, I see people want to, especially sellers, they want to talk about price per square foot, price per square foot, price per square foot. But if you're the largest house in the subdivision, mm -hmm. your price per square foot kind of creeps down a little bit to the, to the average. You're like the average of the five you hang out with, right? right. They talk about that in life and, and like, like you're the average of your friends and your peer group. I guess that goes true for properties as well. Well, it's just the, the larger the house is, 
the less it costs per square foot to build, the less it returns. So that, that's one of the things when Josh was saying the the um, data in the MLS, if the square footage is wrong, then we're not comparing similar size houses. We need similar size houses, and and the GSEs don't want the big the biggest house in the neighborhood. They want a they want a typical average house for the neighborhood that a typical buyer would buy when they're looking. They don't want the biggest house in the neighborhood. So, <laughs> Improved, the underimproved exactly. is just kind of like in the middle. So you you talk about like this, like the measurements, the square footage, right? I'm thinking, okay, if it's air conditioned space and it's finished out the same as the rest of the house, like a garage conversion, I I'm guessing it needs to be finished out the same. It needs to have central heat and air just like the rest of the house or whatever. It needs to be very similar, right? So I assume those are conten contentions that I've heard of. What other contentions? are there that people add adus <laughs> ADU. A, a, additional dwelling unit or basically a, a mother-in-law suite or a, a guest house that's in the backyard a garage apartment oh um, that's detached mm -hmm. um uh -huh. so we see a lot of people add those into the gross living area of the property and then they try to use the price per square foot method and then they get very, very angry when uh, the report comes back showing something completely different. So well, that, I usually tip, make those about half, like if it's $100 a square foot, I'll give it like 50 bucks a square foot. Where am I off on that ideology? Well, because we can't just pick that number. You have to find similar properties to compare it to, which is very, very hard. But the, again, the lender doesn't want a house when you're the only one with an AD. Um, they want to see if this is typical for the neighborhood. And what Josh was saying, some of our older neighborhoods have the mother-in-law suite or they were servants quarters in Corpus Christi. And that has to be counted separately. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't count. It just has to be counted separately. So we have to look at two or three of them side by side and look at the differences and how the market reacted to those additional dwellings. What if it is isn't a comp? What if, what if it's a unique property and there isn't a comparable in that subdivision for that space that they added on above the garage. That's, that's the hard thing. You kind of have to find another amenity that might contribute, but the lender doesn't want the only one like that. They don't want the unicorn. They want so it. You, do. you just have to dig deep until you find something. And sometimes there isn't go, anything. There right. isn't anything. If the only one in a one mile radius that well, and you look, there's no hard and fast rules about one mile. If you're looking at a house with an ADU and that's the driving force and what you're searching for, then go look for another house with an ADU and it could be in a competing neighborhood. There's not a hard and fast rule about one mile. You might not give it a lot of weight because it's in a different I'm, I'm, neighborhood. Let me throw out five miles. You can do that. Yep. I have no rule. Well, I mean, I'm just saying, miles. what if you cannot find another? So you just keep spreading out till you find another house with a with an ADU. I now that now that I I use that ADU, I can't even imagine what I can picture what it stands for. ADU stands for what again? Give me accessory dwelling unit. Yeah. Accessory dwelling, dwelling unit. unit. Got it. That that shed that I converted into an Airbnb. Got it. It has to have a kitchen. Yeah. To call it an ADU, it has to have a kitchen. It yes. has to have a kitchen. So oh so what kind of a kitchen? Can it be like a kitchenette where you just put like an electric, um, you know, one of those electric uh, burners and a, and a little sink? It should have cooking water and refrigeration. Just so, a mini, so a college mini fridge, a little plug in. Yeah, I, I prefer not to have those, but then again, so uh, back to the, no, you can't find it. Count it. In yeah. your ADU, I'm just curious. So, I mean, you can switch it if you don't, like sometimes if I don't feel like it's a full kitchen that you could actually live in there and cook and function, then it will be a bonus space. It won't be an ADU, mm. but it still gets a different line. And I think back to Josh's um, concerns, when it gets added into the same house square footage, that causes the most problems. And again, with the, with the garage ad additions or the garage, renovations they can be configured in the same level of, of finish as the rest of the house but if you would look at a 1600 square foot house and they converted a 400 square foot garage and it's only one big room it's 
truly not comparable to a 2,000 square foot house. A 2,000 square foot house is going to have a bigger kitchen and bigger bathrooms and all the rooms will be bigger. Maybe they'll have one more bedroom, but um, it's just we have to look at all that balance just because they added it. And then you're taking away your amenity of a garage. And if everyone else in the neighborhood has a garage, then you're again the unicorn. So yeah. that's the deal. So when I when I go to as a realtor, I go to price the house, right? And we always talk about okay, we want to price the house so that it will appraise. Mm -hmm. It always right? appraises. That's that's your turn, Josh. Is it going to appraise? Uh, I mean, that's really. I mean, our whole purpose is to uh, we're we're never trying to hit a contract price. We're always trying to actually decipher what the market is doing. Right. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's a big issue where a lot of people say it under appraises. It's like, well, it didn't under appraise. It just appraised for a market value that's different than your contract price. And so there's there's a lot of confusion in those terms because um, contract price is not always fair market value. And we have to appraise according to fair market value, which is very specific in the terms um, like the. I mean, whether it's the IRS or the FDIC, OCC. Um, all these government agencies have a specific um, a definition of what fair market value is. And that's what appraisers are required to appraise to. And that becomes difficult for some agents because uh, we'll see them try and price a house at the very top of the market where it's impossible to support. And even though they've got the contract for it, um, they're upset when the property comes in at fair market value. And we have to appraise that way as to what is the most probable and likely value that this home will transfer for. Because as a bank, if we take the property back, we want to be able to make sure we actually recoup our funds. And if somebody paid 30,000 over what the fair market value is for it, we're not going to lend that extra 30,000. So here's my, here's my, here's my, I, my question is what mistakes do agents make that, they're not pricing it at fair market value. What are some mistakes? Because really at the end of the day, I want like when sellers go to price their home and listing agents go to put a list price and advise the seller. Because in my opinion, the worst thing we can do is overprice it. Because if we price it at fair market value, then and then we get a contract for more, we can get an appraisal clause that says the buyer will contribute the difference. But if we overprice it, right, then the buyer's not prepared to pay the difference. But if we price it right, we drive the price up. That's what brings up the value, which I don't see that happening as much in our market. It's September of 2024, right? But that's what drives the prices up. So if we're educating an agent and educating a seller on how to price at fair market value, like don't screw it up like this. Like this, you, you, I love that you got this amount of money and I can totally see that. And the market might say that, but that's not what, that's not going to appraise. So what the is, market, the market is what it appraises for. I think that the biggest tool that agents can use is a good CMA, honest to goodness CMA. Is this what other buyers would look at? That's what we're going to look at. If you're willing to pay X amount for this house, is the next guy willing to pay that as well? Or what would that buyer look at if they were looking at your house? What is the strongest aspect of that house that they would go look for? And that's why the, the measurement in miles isn't necessarily the same. Sometimes it's a school district, right? They want to be within a certain school district. Sometimes it's age. Maybe they want a newer home so they don't have as many maintenance requirements. Maybe they want a large yard, maybe they want a small yard. So weeding it down into the most similar properties and what have they sold for, in addition to what is the supply, are there any others like it? That, that's what a proper CMA will look at, true comparables within a certain age range, within a certain area, within a certain utility. So you can't spend too much time on your CMA, it's just, a best tool ever and part. i really think you have to keep your eight year sellers away from the third party syndicate information because none of that is verifiable that's just someone puts it out there no one no checks and balances and they oh, you're talking about like the zillows of the world like yeah. the zestimates I'll, I'll go ahead and just say it. so the zestimates and a lot of that is 
especially in Texas, because we're non-disclosure state. Mm-hmm. Right. And especially I'm seeing right now, a lot of contracts are coming um, unless they are they have the HDTV effect, right? You know what I mean when I say that, right? Like they, they're, they're just like, oh, wee. If they're if they're anything a uh, slightly below the HDTV effect, they're not going to go for list price. And I don't know that the um, seller concessions are in there as well, which is huge. And mm-hmm. also now we have real estate compensations on Form twenty four oh six, and I believe in January they're actually going to put that into the contract. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but that's always kind of been a part of it. There's people that are saying, oh, this is going to affect appraisals, but I don't see how it's different. Y'all give me your your take on that. Okay. So, uh, Kathy knows. He he, he actually went like this. He actually went like this. It's a huge topic right now. We're really trying to help work together on this because it's huge. Yeah. So, here's the major issue that we have seen from a lot of MLS boards is that they are trying to combine concessions and commissions. However, when we go into the the government-sponsored entity guidelines, they have a very specific criteria for what is considered a concession. And so, now we have agents and boards trying to combine those concessions with their commissions. And we have to actually now go call the agents and verify what percentage of that concession in MLS is actually a commission and what is actually a concession. Because if we don't and say that there's $30,000 of a concession listed within the MLS and 24,000 of that is actually a commission that was done to both buyer and seller agents. If the appraiser does not call and verify that and they just go strictly off of what is in the MLS, it's a minus thirty thousand dollar adjustment. Well, here's a here's something that just just happened, right? So we had a deal in the contract. The seller refused to pay more than blank percent. In the buyer's rep agreement, it said that it was this percent. So the buyer, um, the seller refused to pay it. So what the agent did is they put it in paragraph twelve a one b, right, as a concession yep. to help the buyer pay that commission compensation, that buyer yeah. compensation that was exactly. agreed. Yeah. And that's going to happen even more with the new contracts. And so it's even bigger than what our MLSs are allowing. NAR in their settlement FAQs are, are encouraging that. And they never thought about what it's going to do for reporting to the GSDs. I talked to one of the attorneys at Texas Realtors. She looked at me with real big eyes and said, we, we didn't even think of that. Um, so it's going to be a reporting issue for us so that we can figure out apples and apples. And if the buyer, if the buyer maybe pays their agent fully out of the transaction, we need to know that. Now, in the past, there was a typical norm, right? There was a simple range that you could pretty much assume that that, that was in the transaction, right? So much for the buyer's broker, so much for the seller um, listing agent. But we can't, we can't assume that anymore so when our when our numbers are off balance we have to determine why so then we look at those reported concessions and we have to determine if that made the difference or not or was it really a new roof and so like josh is saying we have to call and verify and that's where i get on my pedestal about the fact that in texas to be an appraiser you must belong to your mls to belong to your MLS, you must belong to Texas Realtors. You must belong to National Association of Realtors. Therefore, appraisers are realtors. We hold a professional real estate license. We are members of NAR. We abide by the ethics rules that all agents abide by. Therefore, please answer our questions. We know it's confidential. We understand that. the the meaning of fiduciary responsibility. But in order to continue in our processes, we just need to know in in every transaction, we will decide whether or not it made a difference. But if we don't know, then we can't figure out what might be making the difference and how things balance out. Now you said it will be in the contract and it will be in the contract for the the sale, but we will not see the contracts for the comparable. Right. So it sounds it sounds like a lot of this is now like the transparency is gone. It is. 
And which is such a shame. I, I, I believe in transparency. I believe that transparency is our checks and balances. Um, that's keep just my honest. personal keep opinion. Keep us honest. Transparency is right. us honest, right? So, um, so it sounds like as listing agents and as agents, we're going to need to do the same thing as you and make that phone call and ask, okay, how much of this was realtor compensation? How much of this was um, sell, true seller concessions towards either the lender, the repair or whatever, whatever it can be for 12A1B right. um, was. So it sounds like that's going to be even more important now than it has ever been. Yeah. And one of the best things you can get to clarify it all, the settlement statement. It, it will break out what the compensations were and the closing costs to where people can easily, de- well, for us as appraisers, we can easily determine what was what in the transaction. But we can't disclose a settlement statement, can we? To who? You can. You can disclose it to us. Can I, with, do I need my client's permission to do that? Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's my thought. It's like, I cannot disclose that. And then I have to have their permission. That seems like that needs to be another. So it seems like if somebody is making a buyer's rep agreement Mm -hmm. or a listing agreement, that might be a checkbox in there Mm -hmm. that says that we can, that we can uh, submit, disclose, share the closing statement. Because on the MLS, on the, on the listing agreement, it also says, you know, can I just what you can and cannot disclose as well. Mm-hmm. So that seems like that might be the next level. And that um, won't happen until after it closes, right? Like that's when your settlement statement comes in and that's when we're going to need you to tell us. But the other thing is that not all MLSs are going to treat this similarly. Each MLS who, who, who is doing it correctly? Who is doing it like? Is HAR? Is it Metro Tax? Who's doing HAR, it? HAR is already walking back some of the things they decided to do. They put a spot in there where you could put the concessions amount, a number amount, and they have agents putting in three and two point five, and and they're until so they're misleading. And that HAR is rethinking that. We just saw all of them at, at Shaping Texas. Um, Corpus Christi has a yes no yes no drop down. Are you are concessions being offered? Yes or no? And and there's there's communication about whether or not they can put the dollar amount in the verbiage and the remarks, but that's still a little sketchy. And Texas Realtors is talking about it. National Association of Realtors is talking about it because if part of that is by our broker's fees, then what do we know? We're divulging, right. we're disclosing, and we're not allowed to disclose even upon closing. That's what. California was doing at closing. They were saying you can do this and this. I think Stabor is doing that too. At closing and closing remarks, they're putting in their sellers, sellers, buyer brokers fees and um, seller brokers fees. And the settlement says they may not be disclosed, not just offered, but they may not be disclosed. So it's a learning curve right now, and everyone's trying to get it most correct to serve our clients, but agree with um, abide by the settlement. Right. So I know like sellers want to know what is typical in the market and they want to go with that. So I'm so now I'm I'm chasing title reps and um and lenders who see a ton of contracts come through. It's like, okay, be and I used to do the same thing. I'm like, okay, what are we seeing in earnest money? What are we seeing in option money? What are we seeing in option days? What are we seeing in sellers' concessions? Now it's and then it's like, what are you seeing in all of this stuff? And there's one lender that's been really good about sharing what they see in a in a newsletter and I'm like thank you because sell our clients they want to know they want to know what they're what they're competing with in the market yeah it's uh it's definitely one of those things where uh all these changes and everyone doing it different has made it complete chaos <laughs> It's the best way to explain it. What what would make it be less chaotic? What systems and processes or what could we change as an industry to streamline if our mindsets, what mindset shift could we make so it isn't so chaotic? That's that's a hard one. Um, (laughs) 
I didn't mean to stump you. <laughs> well, I think it's communication. I don't think we can fix. I don't think we can fix what has been settled on. Um, we just have to learn to work within it. And so I think communication is all we can do to fix it. Just to talk yeah. to one another, answer the phone, save our numbers. Same with agents to agents. Save each other's numbers. Call back quickly. We're very bad about being midnight and going, okay, this doesn't make sense. What am I missing? So appraisers have to get used to asking ahead of time versus wait till the last minute. But communication is going to be key, like the old days before we even had MLS, right? Like you right. had to talk to one another to find out what was happening. I don't yeah. think there's an easy fix. I think that we have to work within the settlement, and it's, it's we've lost transparency, so we've got to communicate. That's, that's the only solution yeah. I see at this time. I'd like to say a uniform reporting in the MLS, but if you are following the – the settlement as I've been taught it, none of that can be in the MLS. So it's so, co so cooperating agent is next level now, which I love because I think those who have a reputation and a history for being cooperative versus combative, yes. because in this industry, we're really going to need to be more cooperative and less combative. And I think that with our appraisers, with our team, our title team, our appraisal team, our our inspection team, our lending team, our processors, everybody wants the same goal, and that's to do the right thing. Yeah. Right. It only mm -hmm. becomes it only becomes um, iffy when somebody's trying to get away with something. I agree. I agree. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. So. And what are some things that people are trying to get away with? Oh, yeah, I know y'all are like wanting to go here. I'm like, I want to know up front what mistakes not to make so that on the back end, you're not going here going, oh, Lord, what are they trying to do here? What, where did this come from? Well, we can go all the way back to the square footage. If it's reported improperly, then you get three days before closing and found out your house doesn't doesn't appraised to the size you sold it at because it's not allowed to be reported that way in our guidelines. So I just, where do people get these numbers from? Because t typically the numbers that we put in our listing agreement or in our, in our MLS either came from an appraiser or from the tax roll. Right. Well, They're not made up and just come from a, mm -hmm. so are you telling me people just make up these numbers? They used to allow owners owner's estimate for those square footage. So we've come a long way with that, like my MLS boat, right? Being at the, at the board. But um, yeah. when there's conflict, when they're, so the tax records are gonna include everything they can as if it's the main house, because that's how they tax. So they don't have those guidelines. Um, in July, 2022, that Fannie Mae adopted a standard that we must measure by. I, I've always measured by that standard. It's the um, ANSI, American National Standards Institute. They, they are the standard for many measurements across the country. And this is living square footage. So um, if you have a question about your size of your house that is not doesn't seem to match tax records, or you if you have an old appraisal sketch, our MLS allows that to be used. Not all of them do. But you can always hire an appraiser to just come measure for you. Yeah, and and to reiterate what Kathy was saying, uh, I mean, central appraisal district records are not correct. I just recently measured a house up in Plano where they had uh, the entire house as just a little over 2,000 square feet, and they had the first floor completely wrong in terms of size, and it actually was 2,400 square feet. Um, and... Um, that you know that that happens uh, especially with older houses where you know this 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 couple had been in the house since 1983 and so nobody had actually done an appraisal on the property since then um so you, you can come up with some surprises like that but we also see where in the central appraisal district records that they will have uh you know first floor living area you know uh, 1800 square feet, second floor living area, 400 square feet. And then they may have like garage apartment, another 400 square feet. And so they include that all as gross living area for their records, but that's not what we have to appraise by. And so that's, that's where a lot of confusion happens as well. So let's talk pools. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's tell me about pools because 
I'm like, I'm like, it depends. People want to add 10% for pool. I'm, I'm like, my rule of thumb is five to 10%. If you have, and as long as it's, it makes sense. Like if you have a million dollar home and you have a top of the line pool, we can add more. If you live in a hundred thousand dollar house with a $200,000 pool, we might give you, you know, 30,000 for that. Right. So what, where, where do you, how do you figure that out? Like if I'm, if you're teaching me to give value for that and not overprice our listing, teach me. (laughs) It's like, well, this is where it gets fun. And so this is where you try to. I love fun. Yeah. (laughs) So everything we have to do has to be supported through the market. We have to be able to prove the reaction. And one of the best ways for us to do that would be to go to a subdivision that has very similar pools or, you know, has very similar properties, uh, similar square footage, same quality condition, same type of builders usually. And you're able to find, you know, a 1500 square foot house compared to a 1550 square foot house that has a pool and one without. So that difference in market values where you start deriving your adjustments and you don't just want to have one pair you want to have three four five if you can and then you're able to start deriving what the market's paying for it at that point in time and you can scale that up based on the fact of like you know if we're on a a q4 subdivision uh sorry going to uh if, if you're an average, like, I need you to stop using F D I C O C C Q four. Like, let's use real words here. Yeah, These sorry, are was, safe, yeah. it's a safe space for real words. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was trying to. I, I realized that what I did right then, and so uh, basically, an average home. Um, so if you have a bunch of average home, tract homes from like DR Horton, Megatel, that sort of thing. And then you have a more custom home where you have like Bloomfield and that sort of situation. You can scale that percentage of the sales price up to the other subdivision. Okay. I agree. Like that's a pretty picture though. When we can get side by side, two properties, the only difference in these properties, maybe a small square footage difference with the, 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 Biggest difference is the pool. Okay, so you extract that, and then those should balance. It is better to have more. If you're the only pool in a comparable neighborhood, what what's it worth? What's the buyer willing to pay? Um, we can go back to one of our biggest issues is cost does not equal market value. Um, one of the examples my sponsor taught me is that you can put a golden toilet seat in your bathroom and spend $2,000 on it, but the buyer is gonna remove it. They don't want that. So we have to be real careful that just because we spent that money on it doesn't mean that the market will support it. So back to pools, it's, it's a difficult thing. I think that the cost of industry has been since COVID and people were stuck at home, more pools got more popular. But um, if it's typical- well, let's say, So let's say my house with the pool, let's say the average days on market, is 120 days but the average days on market for a pool is 15 days yes that's when you look at the similar properties okay so these both sold for 15 days because they both had pools and what was the difference in sales price um rpr is a very good tool have you used rpr yeah i love rpr so what about let's say that house let's say that house has Pebble Tech pool with fountain, waterfall, and a and a heated spa attached. Mine is a standard square gunite, no spa attached. Is that pool gonna give mine a little bit more value? Because it, we can't, we just it's just really hard for us to get that explicit. But you have to, but you have to like how do you make that decision? I, I'm not saying it's easy. If it, I have answers to the easy questions, I need answers to the hard questions. So <laughs> Yeah. So, so how do you how do you look at that? Because that because te- ha- this happens. This is real, happens. right? Yeah. So technically, that is what we could call a, a super adequacy. Um, so if everyone has mostly your, your your gunite pools, and then you have this one pool in the subdivision that is just way above the top, um, then at that point in time, the from our standpoint with the GSEs, that's not what the typical market's going to pay for that kind of a pool, and it becomes a super adequacy. And uh, so, I mean, we'll give a contributory value, but you're not going to get what you spent on it. What if it's the opposite? What if 
the other pools are, are the mm-hmm. are the better one and yours is not as nice as theirs will you give right. mine just a little bit more value just because so there's, like, there's yeah there's approaches it average it up? there's 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 different approaches to value so there's the sales comparison analysis there's the cost approach and the income approach and we balance all those different angles at the end of the day i, I have a grid with i typically start with 15 sales just to see how the market's moving and I can do some cost appreciation and some regression, regression analysis to see what, which um, amenities are contributory and for how much. And at the end of the day, we do a sensitivity analysis along the bottom. If we have derived the market reactions correctly, our sensitivity analysis will be within a range. So if we're, if we're out of that range, well, maybe that, that better pool was the difference. Um, we can always give most weight to the most similar property. They're not just all added together and averaged, right? You can look at this one's more similar or most similar. So when I reconcile my report, I'm going to say this one's most similar. So this is, this is where the opinion of value will come in. And I can't exactly get them even along the bottom. So there's a range. We used to get to report in ranges, um, but now we have to give an exact number. So sensitivity helps you determine if that nuance made any any big difference in the in the bottom line how much weight does um so you know like us realtors sometimes we'll deliver we'll 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 want to give to and appraisers are different some are like they don't want to see a realtor for nothing and then you have some appraisers like oh thank you you just made my life easier Right. Some are like offended by the realtor showing up like I've been doing this for 150 years. I've done a million properties. Why do you think I need this? You know, and so how can a realtor help an appraiser like just help them? Like, how can we be part of that team while not offending and still being helpful as though we're teammates? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I'll be real quick with this appraisal appraisal packets. Um, absolutely, do those. You know, if an appraiser is offended by absolutely. someone giving, absolutely. Wait, hold on. You you went by that really fast. You said absolutely do an appraisal packet. Yes. Before we move forward, we're gonna pause right there. What describe to us what is in an appraisal packet? Uh, so what's within an appraisal packet is just general information on the subject. So if there have been improvements and uh, remodels done to the property, what year were those done? Um, you know, if you have a new hot water heater installed, when was the roof replaced? All your major components, uh, you know, if the bathroom was remodeled, what year was it remodeled? Uh, the kitchen, um, that detailed information really helps us establish a new effective age for the property and to give it the proper credit that it's due. Also, the comparables that you use to list the property or come up with your contract price and explaining why you use those comparables all of that's very beneficial to the uh to the appraiser because you know sometimes there may be something where a property is on mls and it's kind of off the wall in value and the realtor may know that that was due to a foundation issue on this property that didn't get put into mls um, and I've, I've seen that personally where I've looked at a house where the photos look great online. I get there and like there's no photos of the garage. I open up the garage and that slab is all kinds of jacked up. <laughs> so, um, Especially in North Texas. We're like, woo! Yes. So, um, yeah, I mean, being able to uh, relay that information to us really helps us give some better values as to what's going on. Um, and you know, this, this is also going to play into the fact with the, uh, the new ROV request procedures that are put well, out there. R- ROV. Reconsideration of value. So, uh, that's going to be a huge one for agents coming up because, uh, a lot of agents have just been in the habit of sending, um, four or five cells, uh, for the bank to send to the appraiser and saying, well, what about these? That's no longer the case anymore. Now there is a specific procedure that will have to be done. And basically it's a a maximum of five comparable cells that can be sent to the appraiser. And they need to, the agent needs to be able to explain why those are 
good comparables. And so you need to be able to can say, this, can this come from the realtor or does it have to go through the lender, through the management company, through the appraiser? Has to go. The, yeah. Has to go through lender and then they send it to the AMC and then they send it to the appraiser. Or if you happen to have a appraisal department that deals directly with appraisers like mine, um, it would come directly to me. I would review what, has been submitted and I would actually go into MLS as well. And look well, that's because you work with the bank, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it still has to go to the bank yeah. uh, management company, to the appraiser. The realtor cannot reach out to the appraiser directly. No. Well, as, the, as before it's done, you can. That's what the appraisal packet is so important for, right? That's yeah. your communicative tool. And there are cranky appraisers that are going to say, don't do my job for me. And we apologize for them. Like that, That's all we can do. But that's your opportunity to communicate. This is how I priced it. And this is how I, de this is how I determined what to offer for it. So appraisal packets on both sides of the conversation are very helpful. Honestly, sometimes at the very beginning, you can, and and you can leave them there at the property for them. We would prefer you email them to us ahead of time. What, there's so many things. When we are going to use a property as comparable, we are we are required to view it from the street at least. So when I'm in that neighborhood, I need to go view all those properties I might be putting in the report. Therefore, having them to us beforehand helps us stay in that neighborhood one time. If you send one to me a week later, I have to go back. If yep. I didn't look at that property, I have to go back. So that's appraisal packet. They, sh they should be ready. And honestly, in Texas, as a listing agent, it's mandatory that you run a CMA. Give it to us. Yes. Just give so it to just us. Give you the so just give you the CMA from when we went to list the property. And yeah. if we just send that over to you with the notes with and the notes. like pink yeah. or gel pen so that you, yeah. so it stands out so you can see it. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the thing. Even if, so if it's been listed for a long time and new new things have happened, then you can add those in too. But a 10 minute CMA when I ask you for data is almost insulting. I, I need to know deeper. I need to know why did your buyer want to buy this? Because if it's because their mother in law lives down the street, then that's not a typical buyer. So that's not going to lead to the most probable price. So sometimes when I get agents comparables they use, it, it further explains why it's overpriced because they didn't use true comparables. So that's a great starting point and that may eliminate the necessity for a reconsideration about you because I already have your data. I already know what your buyer was thinking. I know what your seller was thinking. And I have done appraisals for, appraisals for people, listing agents told their seller, no, it's not gonna, that's not what the price should be. It should be lower. So I've gone in and done an appraisal. They lower the price in itself. So all that data, we understand that you have to appease your seller, but all of that data, what were you thinking? What was the buyer thinking when they were looking at your house and what made them choose this house and spend that much money? So that's market. But you're teaching us more about what the market's doing because you're in it. So it sounds like, okay, so on the seller side, as a listing agent, we do the we can send you the comps to justify our list price. Yes. So when the buyer chooses to maybe quote unquote pay over list price, the buyer's agent can actually go in and say, "We have been looking for properties for nine months, and when this property came on the market, it had this, 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 and this, which makes it an um." like a super property, but that's why the value was there. And it's really not that super. So maybe you can help me by like, yes. give me a little extra value above fair. If it was just the average, because that one, that house over there had rickety foundation issues. Right. This one doesn't, this one has a new roof. This one has a top of the line pool, this one. And then at some point it becomes over improved. Yes, huh? but, but so, why is your buyer? Why is your buyer? Why were they willing to pay that much? And then, like Josh said, it's not every buyer is willing to pay that much. So if you just have a new buyer, home, right? So well, I call it the HDTV effect, right? right? If you have like the H, people joke, but HDTV effect is a real thing. It gives real value for buyers. And the word maybe not appraisers. Right. Does that impact appraisers? 
the worst thing they do on those shows is they say we put in a hundred thousand dollars and we got a hundred thirty thousand dollars more for it it's, that's the worst thing they do because they mislead the public thinking they're going to get every dollar back that they put in they, they totally mislead the public so that's a oh. Job that's well. a bad stager, right? A, a stager yeah. like looks at ROI. You need to have it. Yeah. So, yeah. so a house that is unstaged versus a house that is staged. How does that impact for you guys on values and stuff? None. None at all. None. <laughs> so, a house that is unstaged versus a house that is staged. How does that impact for you guys on values and stuff? None. None at all. None? Pretty in it. Yeah. It's like... As, a, is, as is vacant. As if vacant. Yeah. So, list, so marketing, from the realtor point of view, we're trying to get as much value. Right. Right? And then you're just kind of like, it is what it is. Right. Uh, it, well, you want to you want to know what it looks like without the lipstick because when you wake up in the morning, you want to you're you're giving the value to what you're waking up to. Yeah, was right. that I, that that might not have been the friendliest. Well, can put his lipstick on today, so that could be it. Yeah, I've had a, yeah. I had a buyer say they bought one condo over another because it had a better sleeper sofa. It had a better what sleeper sofa because it was a short term rental. So I can't value that. It's a couch. You can't you can't mortgage your couch. Yeah, um, and and that is something we even also, if you put it on the non realty item addendum can't put it in a mortgage. Uh uh That couch ain't gonna last thirty years. I was, I was gonna say I've I've actually seen this where a purchase contract had a hundred thousand dollars worth of furniture in there and they tried to mortgage it and they were very very furious when we told them we can't finance the uh, the personal property. <laughs> so. Right. So non realty item is like refrigerators. It doesn't matter unless it's a built in. Right. Right. You're like I know you spent a ten thousand dollars on that. How do we how do we build that so frame it out so it's built in? And then if you frame it out, then it's a realty item, right? Well, but it could be an over improvement at that point. Uh, I understand. It's tricky. We have to look at all this big big view stuff. But yeah, we have to we have to value it as so I'm asking, but I'm asking if you if you have that that refrigerator, it's a ten thousand dollar refrigerator and you want it to be included as a realty item, we just pay a framer a hundred. 200 bucks to frame it out then it's a realty item is that is that accurate yeah yeah okay yeah if it I can't be want... if it can't be moved uh without altering things then yeah it's it's attached to the property um and to be fair most people aren't going to want to move a ten thousand dollar sub-zero fridge <laughs> to the next property exactly um so i just was wondering because sometimes there's like little things like that that we can do right that can be make a non-realty become a realty or that we can add value right really quick what would you say and i'm not saying for over improvement we're not i'm not trying to get improvement i'm just trying to get fair market value what are some things that sellers can do because we hire a stager to help with this right she goes in and does a staging consultant with our sellers so that they get the best roi without over improving without spending money but as an on from an appraiser perspective what are some things that sellers can do that are wise that would give them value not marketability because I, I i look at marketability but what is it that is an incredibly difficult question because it all varies based on what comparables are doing for that particular subject. Um, it's a, Let's say the subdivision is a $700,000 subdivision, right? There are quarter acre lots, um, 0 0.2 to 0 0.25 acre lots. Let's go 1.5 to two acre lots. That's probably more typical in our area, right? And let's say the the homes are approximately 15 years old and roughly a $700,000 value. Right now, right, I'd like outside of marketability, lipstick. What are some things that you see that you're like, okay, this is, this is quick for me to add value for that's I not square footed? I think you eliminate any, any views of depreciated 
condition. Anything that needs to be repaired, you can repair it. Because overall condition is a big aspect. Say, there's something to be said for move-in ready, right? You can walk in and put your furniture down. So anything that looks like depreciated maintenance or that needs to be cleaned up, and not just paint on the wall, because right, I might hate the color you painted it, but no, no visible depreciated maintenance because so like like the the black stuff that grows in the grout out yeah. Yeah. the caulk that's yeah. been kind of <laughs> it got ugh. rip it out put in new caulk right on the outside rotten wood i guess even if even if it's a little bit yeah. get it handled rotten yeah. wood in fha you cannot have any rotten wood you can't have peeling paint and then you have the whole lead based paint for the older home but if we can walk in and not see any deferred maintenance, that's gonna that's gonna raise your condition level. Um, and then you go into the upgrade, you know, upgrades compared to what the neighbors had and what the other sales had and what did that move the market. But deferred maintenance, that's I was using the wrong word earlier. Deferred maintenance is the biggest issue to help yeah. contribute to condition, and that helps us put it at a higher level of condition. There's six condition ratings and six quality ratings that we have to assign to each property and so getting what higher on that condition you know, what are the six condition ratings q1 through q6 and then c1 through c6 are conditions and in every report it should have the definitions in the re, in the report there's a uad definition so what we, so you're trying to give me an idea of like uh like a a, a summary like okay a maybe c1, like a a c1 C1 is brand new. Never is been what? Lived, brand new. Never been lived, never been occupied. C2, okay. I, I'm paraphrasing, but C2 is very lightly lived in, typically less than a year, maybe two with no scrapes, right? Like it still smells good. Um, and then C3 is no deferred maintenance, right? Is that what you would call it, Josh? Yeah, uh, no obvious signs of deferred maintenance. The house has been well maintained. Uh, you know, you you'd be able to move into it and not have to worry about something being repaired immediately. And then there's C4, which is where there is some minor deferred maintenance. There's obvious signs that the property has been worn. Uh, so you know, and that could be uh, kids Crayola marks on the wall and baseboards that have been damaged by puppies um you know it could what about be uh, carpet? how huh? about like older carpet uh yeah uh, older carpet that's uh, started to come up and wrinkled and is um coming that sorry that's losing its stretch um you know that's that's an obvious sign as well um you know uh really old appliances old old appliances Minor deferred maintenance and physical de deterioration due to normal wear and tear. Yeah. It's been maintained, but it shows some wear and tear. And that's the thing. Go stretch the carpet. Right? Get that carpet stretched. Get it clean. Because that can put it into C3 versus C4. Mm -hmm. It's deferred carpet maintenance. Carpet stains too. Pretty typical. Mm -hmm. What else? And, and keep going? C5. Obvious deferred maintenance and are in need of some significant repairs. Many lenders will not lend if it's C5 or C6. C6 is substantial damage. What are some so what are some examples of C5? So like carpet needs stretching? Oh no no. Like, no C5 no. is carpet's missing. C5 is carpet holes, missing. In the, holes in the wall. C5 is um what does it say? They're in need of significant. Some building components need repairs, rehabilitation, or updating. So if like the appliances are missing, like right. the like the microwave and the stove, if they're missing? No, because those are personal property. The functional utility and overall livability is somewhat diminished due to condition. Mm -hmm. And that might be smell, right? That might be strong smell or the the block substance, like that. Cigarette smoke, is that considered a strong smell? I think so. Pet so, urine. Pet urine. I pet urine, cat <clears throat> cat urine. So yeah. if the, if if you have strong cigarette smells, cat urine, um, missing carpets, things like that, that might not that might disqualify you from like a regular conventional loan and you might have to do it what an 
a fixer upper loan, well, but you only get thousand credit. Always, for it. You can always remedy it, right? But it's the, the I think the key sentence in C five is the functional utility and overall livability is somewhat diminished due to this condition. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's not you can't live in it similarly to other houses because it's the condition level is lower. C six yeah. is like you absolutely need new roof. You got exposed wire, you know, just holes in the walls and it's you safety. Know. It's a safety it's, issue. Yeah, C six is a safety where you cannot live in the property safely. And um, you know, and, and another good example of a C five condition would be let's say something yes. happened in the bathroom and you had a major water leak and now the bathroom's out of use. Um, you've got to replace all the drywall and that sort of thing. That that can be as part of a C five condition. Um, but just because it affects that one bathroom and that particular functionality. So the rest of the house can be good, but if your bathroom is completely jacked up um, or not usable, then that's going to get a C5. That's going to get a C5 and that might hinder a buyer being able to qualify for a, for your well, typical you conventional can, or FHA. If you count it as a bathroom, it doesn't function. So if you, instead of, let's say a five bedroom, four bath house, can it's a five bedroom, three bath house. Right. So do you do, could they, could that be an exception? Like, can we just say, okay, it's a five bedroom, three bath, just, just kind of appraise it as a five bedroom, three bath. And we know that we got to fix that one later. Well, we have to tell it, we have to tell them what's there. And then the lender often decides. Yeah. So how, so does a lender typically say, nope. Or, okay, well, we understand the buyer's going to intend to go in and fix that on their own. And the, and it's priced below and it's priced accordingly. Lenders want it fixed. Yeah, they, before, it fixed. before they take on the risk of that, to, especially for almost anything secondary market, they want that fixed because the secondary market will not take it. So your uh, VA, FHA, Fannie Mae, they, they won't take it. Um, now there are portfolio loans that some banks can do, um, and you know they they can do it with the idea that the the borrower is going to be fixing it later. So uh, do they do like know, a hold back or something on that? For for, for for portfolio loan, not necessarily. Um, okay. Because uh, I mean, I've I've done this a lot for internal loans on at our financial institution where we have uh, someone buying the property and it's in rough shape, very rough shape, but we know that they plan on remodeling it. And from our point of view with what the market is paying for that kind of a property, it works and we're well secured collateral wise, but we know that they are remodeling it and we're keeping up on uh, up to date on it. And then eventually they will either turn it into a rental property or sell it themselves. So, um, there are options, but as far as a C5 to secondary market, that's not going to work. It's not going to happen. So we've got the condition. Now, what was the other one that you mentioned? Quality. The other quality. See, Q1 through Q6. I've never seen a Q1. Never. Give me an example of a Q1. What, what's a Q1? A Q1 is completely designed and built for one specific buyer. They may have imported Italian tile. They may have imported something from, you know, another country, high, highest quality of refinement inside. Um, and it's specific to their, that to their style, uh -huh. to their desire, to yeah. their, uh, I, you know, I've seen these on like, like scroll through and yeah. they have like the gold porcelain toilets and all of not yeah. wait, I just contradicted cold and porcelain, but yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Not, and and I, the woodwork, like the wood, the exceptionally high level of woodwork, like you yeah. had someone come in and create your cabinets don't look like you can't buy any of this off market. Like you, this is all built on site for this specific property. You cannot, if you pulled them out, they wouldn't fit anywhere else. They're just yeah. specific for so that. You would appraise those at what replacement value? I've never seen one. So uh, um, most of those don't see the market. Yeah, um, they're, they're very few and far. They, they are actually some of them in North Texas. Uh, yes. I have I have actually been inside one. Um, and it's, you know, when you step in that it's a Q1 because it is just another level of materials that are involved. And 
it really is specifically for that individual owner. I mean, this particular yeah, one had a 5,000 square foot indoor basketball court. <laughs> so, well, um, I, th I think there's a lot of owners that would like an 5,000 square foot basketball court. Yeah. What would, be, what would they be willing to pay for it? Yeah. So do you appraise it as a replacement value? Well, you could if, if you can support that. But um, yeah. typically the sale market analysis is what, is what we want to see. So I, yeah, there, if you can find others like it, then you can do it. He, he said there's several in North Texas. So, so yes. and there's several in North Texas, Josh. Yes. And that's so, you, I, I want to know what you're thinking. And now I'm curious. I, we have to get to, and, and we're going to end this soon, but we're going to have to get to that. But I can't get to two, three, four, five, six until I know how you went about your Q1. I'm curious. I have to know. Um, it gets very, very complicated. Uh, I mean, you're. Of course it does. This is what makes it fun. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. I mean, I... basically, when you get to that level, uh, going secondary markets nearly impossible just because of the variances that are happening and what you're having to do for adjustments. Um, I mean, so, you know, I may have to find something in Highland Park. I may find something up in Plano. I may mm -hmm. find something in Frisco, finding these high quality properties. And then you're having to adjust for the land differences that occur between those. Uh, then you're also having to extract that out and uh, look at what depreciation has occurred on the properties. And then you're taking a look at, OK, we have, you know, this property cost, uh, you know, $800 per square foot to build. This one costs $500 per square foot to build. Once you start extracting that information out, you can start kind of being able to align the quality differences that are occurring between them. Because you may have this Q1 having completely different cost to build than this Q1 over here. And it becomes very time consuming. And uh, they cost a lot more money to do those appraisals because it can take you a week to do the proper analysis. So it sounds like it is you you lean in a lot on because you you mentioned cost to build. So it sounds like you're leaning in on a replacement value. In, in a way, yes. Um, I mean, it's there's there's a combination of methods and. But it's uh, it's very hard to explain. because it revival, is, it, it, there, uh, is it weighted towards replacement value more than, let's say, comparable? No, I don't think so because we can't put all of it on cost approach for those kind of loans. But that's when all of our limits go out the window, right? You can go back further in time and then see what's appreciate what the market's appreciating at. Where's the typical buyer going to look? If they're going to look in this neighborhood, then they're going to look 20 miles away in that neighborhood too. Right. So that's where you have to go wide and far to see where that buyer is going to look. What, mm -hmm. what is that buyer going to consider? So it's still on, on comparables. Depreciated costs can be used, but not necessarily replacement costs because we can't figure that out sometimes. If you had a woodworker come in and build your cabinet, how are you going to, how are you going to replace Import Italian crafted, I, I complete, or, or antique that you brought in from, you know, stone sculpture from the late Roman Empire. Oh, have you seen those porcelain <laughs> columns, right, that they get out of somewhere really cool? Well, you can't put replacement costs on that because there may not be any available. I so, understand. Yeah. yeah. So let's go down to Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, Q6. Okay, I haven't pulled up. So Q2, they're often custom designed for a com on an individual property owner site. So you own the property and you hire a builder to just build that house for you. They draw so plans. custom home build, custom a typical home. custom home build. So you've seen a lot of Q2s. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, this is not exactly a, a, a typical custom. This is, they drew those plans for you. That that was your house. That wasn't their Well, Josh place. sees it in this market. Well, yes. where we're at. Yeah, Josh sees that. Josh is like, Josh is like, yeah, I see Q2s a lot. Yeah, yeah. I don't see Q2s as many because they're mimicking floor plans. And yeah, corp Corpus Christi, I, I, and I, I believe that just depends on your market. Well, so, but you yeah. choose, think, like, yeah. you, can you hire an architect, you, architect, you yeah. hire an architect, they build a house for you, that's a Q2. But in yeah. Puerto Aransas, we have them that they do that, but they all are still similar within the neighborhood. They're using one of five builders, and they're all very similar. So that doesn't always hit Q2, and you can buy the flooring at Home Depot. So it's customized where they picked it out, but it's still... 
that sounds like a, is that a Q3 what yeah. you're referring to? So you're a Q, you do a lot of Q3s in your market. Josh yeah. does a lot of Q2s in his market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Up here in North Texas. Okay. Yeah. So Q3s is like, it's, you get to kind of choose and pick your new construction yeah. stuff, but it's pretty standard. You go into maybe the builder's um, showroom and you get to pick out that, your, right. your, your stuff. That's it's more of a Q3. Readily Q3. available designer plans in above standard residential track. So you see yeah. the builder's plans, but then you personalize it. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty standard. I see that pretty standard in developments. So that's a Q3. What's a Q4? Your tracked home like DR Horton, Megatel, Kindred, um, a lot of those mass produced building properties. Uh, those those are your Q4s. So you've got your your um, so you've got your. I hired an architect and I get to design whatever I want. Q2. You get your higher end uh, builders right. that allows a little bit more customization, but they're still pretty standard. That's a Q3. Then you've got your track homes, which are Q4s. Mm -hmm. What is a Q5? The quality rating feature economy of construction and basic functionality. Dwelling feature of plain design, readily available floor plans with minimal fenestration. So like the complete square, right? It's a rectangle. It has no... It has nothing in and out. There's no nothing other than a square shape, right? Fenestration, how you made this higher than that. ADU. Work. Pardon me? An ADU could be. A, a tiny home. home. They might have more fenestration than some of these. Yep. Is, is this right? Am I understanding correctly? Josh, is that right? Like a tiny home could be a Q5. Yeah, well, it gets really interesting with tiny homes because uh, there are set criteria for what's considered a tiny home versus a recreational vehicle. Yeah. So. Well, if it's not movable, then it's a tiny home, right? Not necessarily. Oh, poopers. <laughs> if it's on a solid cement foundation and it's bolted in and it's like, cool, on like in and it's got permanent utilities, does that make it a tiny home? If it's under 499 square feet, even if it's attached to a foundation, it's considered recreational vehicle. So I need 500 square feet or more. And that can vary per market, though. That can be that can vary in your city or county rules. Yeah, I mean that that can vary in that regards. But if I remember right, whenever I talked with, uh, I think it was HUD, they're the ones that stated because basically the if it's less than 400 and or sorry, if it's less than 500 square feet, it has to be built to like a recreational vehicle code. Whereas if it's higher than that, now it has to be built to local code standards. Oh, so there's benefit in being under 500. Right. Well, it's, but then you might not get the mortgage. Yeah, you might not get the mortgage it though if it's considered yeah. recreational vehicle. You well, can I get an RV, a recreational loan? You don't know. A recreational loan is also can be written off as a secondary home, and you can write off the interest rates. Oh, rabbit hole. It's okay. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm like, my mind just like, doo -doo 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 -doo. okay, six. What's six? What I'm like, what is six? A tent? Well, it's basic quality and lower cost. Some may not be suitable for year round occupancy. Oh. So, a lot of hunting cabins that are on properties and uh, recreational cabins, like these, these happen quite a bit up more in Maine where they are only for three seasons and right. uh, they're not meant to be occupied during winter yeah. they may okay. or may not have plumbing electric that sort of thing so can you get so let's say it's a finished out cabin with um kitchen but no bathroom interior bathroom that would be a q6 not livable i don't think anyone would lend on that nobody would lend on that certainly so you would just go to the value. yeah it certainly won't go to the secondary market right josh i've never done a q6 either no, I won't. It won't go secondary market from my knowledge in that regards. What if, what if you put a composting toilet in there? Maybe, but Q6 overall, I don't think it's going to secondary market. So the secondary market, you know, is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the GSC, and they bundle yeah. everything together. No, here, no, I have a listing that's coming on the market. I want, I need to know what is it going to take if they, without, 
like the the most cost effective way for them to turn this from a Q6 to a Q4. Q4 because we don't want no Q5 no. We don't want Q5. Right. We want a Q4. Yeah. You, right. You, you'd want, I mean, some, there are some Q5s that I've seen go secondary market. Um, but again, you have to be able to show market acceptability. So if it is completely on its own, as like you, you've you got the only Q5 in the market, it's going to be very hard to pass. It's a lake, it's a lake property, right? Let, let's mm -hmm. pretend. This one is specifically a lake property. They, um, it, it's a cabin, right? It's a finished out cabin, but they didn't actually put in the bathroom yet. So, but it doesn't, it would require a septic system, but instead of a septic system, they could do a composting toilet. They can do a, a disintegrating toilet, right? Um, where a combustible, where they burn the, whatever it is that's in there, right? And then add a, add a shower. Well, so that's when you gotta you gotta research your building codes too. They might okay, I, I get that, but mm -hmm. let's it's a lake, da da da. Right. There's no building codes, there's no HOAs, what else there's no out there, it's not in the city. It's I don't it might be in an edge of a county somewhere, but let's say Are there any others? Are there huh? any others? Are there any others like yeah. that? Well, there's, there there's, tons of, there's tons of lake properties with funky stuff all over the place. We're just lucky that this one's actually stable and doesn't isn't leaning like this. So, and it's relatively new in the last five years. Josh, what would it take? What could the seller do so that somebody could get a loan on this for this property? The cheapest, most effective way without putting in a septic system. Uh, that would be... Very difficult because I mean, uh, with, you've got to have some. I mean, you've got to I'm have okay a shower. With difficult. We're not talking about hard or easy. I'm talking about the cheapest, most effective way. Uh, I, I really couldn't advise, to be honest. I would have to see. Uh, there, there's a lot of factors as far as. Because when you're dealing with around the lake, too, you do have to worry about environmental uh, issues. And so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, say, let's say environment is solid, right? Well, I think yeah. that you're onto it with a shower and a toilet and a sink that's functional, that's functional in some way. Then if it's, if it's going along with the rest of the market in, in that area, then that's, sell, that's sellable. So then, then the secondary yeah. might take it. But you might go back to your portfolio loans for those sort of things. And typically that would be a second home. So that might be a buyer that has the ability to go with a hard money loan or a portfolio loan. Some bank that holds the loan in house, then they can make that decision. That would I would research lenders for them on that before you get into yeah. that big concept. Yeah, and, 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 then, and, and would, the appraiser. I just want to make the appraisers happy. Well, wonder, how do we yeah. make you happy? Tell them what comparables you have. Tell them why this buyer is willing to buy this. Is there other? Are there others like it? Yeah. So, I mean, we would, you know, if we're seeing that that's typical in the market, that would make us a lot more comfortable with it. But if it's not typical in the market, then, you know, that's going to bring up some possible issues. Um, yeah. And I've ran into that issue where I've seen a, a leach filled septic system where all the gray water goes out into the leach field. And, you know, that's not typical in the market. Um and so that was uh, that was really fun to try to appraise because I couldn't find any leach filled systems. Um <laughs> So, uh, but it was allowed by the county. And um, so, I mean, it worked. And, you know, they put in a, basically a system to try and catch all the soap and stuff and filter that part out. Um, and I will say the leach field had very green grass. Um, yeah. But uh, it's very eco friendly, it yeah. seems, if you do it right. Like, yeah. So, as long as, as long, because here, Kathy, you're like, uh, like, I want to look at solutions. Like, people want to give me problems. I'm like, give me a solution. Like, what would the solution look like? Well, we always say it depends, it depends, it depends. And it, it's just what's, what's acceptable in your market. What's allowed in current code and zoning? What's allowed in that area? And if there's, a like you said, a wide open, there are no rules, then what's that market telling you? What's that market accepting? Like, there's those steps, right? Legally permissible and, you know, we have to go through all those steps for the highest investment. Once it's legal and permissible, it sounds like possibly a disintegrating toilet and a um, and a shower into a leach field. The same one that that it just joins with the, the one in the kitchen. Right. 
Very well could be. Look yeah, at that. Look at us coming up with solutions to our future sellers. I <laughs> love this. It's funny that we're talking like this because I do a cost and it's ask the appraiser. And and some people want you to do it in an hour and we absolutely cannot. We we just scratched the surface. So there's yeah. so many questions and how do we deal with this situation specifically and that situation and 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 that's why it took us so long to get our license because we have to have all these curveballs thrown at us to see if we are competent to handle them. How long does it take for you to get your license? Minimum of a year. Yeah. So okay. for, for state license, it's a minimum of a year. For certified residential, it's a minimum of a year and a half. And then for certified general, which is your commercial appraiser, it's a minimum of two years. Two years. Back 100 years ago and I did it for certified residential, it was a minimum of two years. And we have to have so many hours proven appraising. We have to give, give them a log thing. I worked on these properties and I did these appraisals and we have to turn those into the state. They'll usually just take a sampling. 1,500 hours, I can't remember, Josh, and it's changed. So, um, yeah. yeah, but we have it's, to prove uh, that we have gone out and done it. Yeah, so it's- Right now, it's, right now, okay. So I'm not getting my appraisals license, so I'm gonna move. I was just curious on that. Right now, do you see appraisals like going in September of 2024, as a general rule, when you talk to other appraisers, right? Are they seeing the val like the values kind of sliding this way, sliding this way? And through the years, we're going into an election, right? I know the statistics from KCM, how, you know, like, yeah, it dips a little bit here, but it comes back. Are you seeing that play out similarly? Like right now, how are you seeing it? Um, In the last back, only talking 2024. So I have seen in some markets values still creeping up, and I have yeah. seen in other subdivisions values creeping down. Um, you know, as you saw in, uh, I guess you have a listing currently in a subdivision I actually live in, and you saw yeah. the, uh, you've seen the values creeping down in that particular subdivision. Sorry. Oh, yeah. It's, it's okay. It's it's one of those where I'm not surprised, to be honest. Um, but then, uh, you know, there's other subdivisions where I've seen them still increasing. Um, and it just, uh, it, it really is all about microeconomics and what is the market doing in specific sections. What are the common denominators that you're finding on the ones that are falling and the ones that are increasing? To, to me, in my market, um, sometimes a school that built a new high school, that sub market will increase in value. They'll trickle up because people are going to move there and pay a little more to go to that brand new school. Um, we've had the same thing happen when a new industry comes to a certain area. They're bringing in more workers and they're paying they're paying for housing. And, and then you get into supply and demand. And can we build houses big enough, um, enough houses to support this industry that came in in this area? So we have that situation in Portland when we got a few, three different factories came in to do different, um, different, like one was making plastic beads, just different industries when they opened our port. So Portland could not keep up fast enough. So they just kept going and they're settling a little bit, but they still are bringing in new employees that need somewhere to live. So yeah, there's like sub markets, little markets, microeconomics is the perfect word because this little niche over here, they're still growing in price because there's a need. Supply and demand yeah. comes into effect. But then maybe something in a certain area is undesirable and no one wants to live there anymore for whatever reason. Could be rumor even. So it, you just have yeah. to go each. That's why it's important. Where would your buyer look? Every one of those little areas. Where Where is your buyer considering? Because that's telling us what they're, they're the market. They're the people telling us what they're doing. So, yeah. And Josh, what, what are you seeing as a micro microeconomics that are kind of the leading indicators in the different microeconomics? Like I see, like I, I know where there's like different niches, but what are you seeing as the common denominators in 2024 for, for the ones that are going up and the ones that are going down? It comes to basically uh, your differences in class and affordability. Um, the areas where that are still increasing, that are in very high demand, people are willing to pay 
a lot of money to be there just because they have the money. And then there's uh, subdivisions, which are more middle class, like where I'm at, where the affordability with the current interest rates, it's just not there anymore. And so in order to get the markets to move, prices are having to come down to where people can afford those properties again. Um, and so, I mean, it really is just kind of what it's is economic your socioeconomic thing. class? Right. So, so, so if we're thinking that, that housing is a leading indicator, economic indicator, and we're seeing, okay, the markets that are moving up are the ones that are affordable, but the middle class, middle social economic um, ones are maybe more impacted by, let's say, interest rates, credit, maybe have been this inflation, they've been kind of that credit card creeping up. We're understanding that savings have gone down quite a bit, right? What do you think it would take for us to bring that economy back, right? So that our housing can come back in that area. Do you think it's going to be the price reduction interest rate? Do you think it's going to have to be something that happens in the economy as a whole that's going to help this? Where where is going to be where is it going to be that is going to help our economy's housing improve so that 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 big sector? It's cuz it's huge sector, mm -hmm. right? How do how do we make that better? How do we help more help that section of the economy move? And that's a big question. I get it. But I was just wondering if you knew, if you have been talking to people about this. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view, it's going to be a combination of both housing prices need to come back down to be more affordable in line with what the middle class and, uh, you know, even what the socioeconomics can afford. So you have, you know, people trying to get into starter homes and some of those starter homes now are three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars. And that's not sustainable when you're making sixty thousand dollars a year. And so I mean, it's a combination of you would need job markets to start paying more in regards to what is being produced, or you need housing prices to come back down in line with that affordability. And then interest rates too. But you've got to be careful with interest rates because you know a lot of people are hoping to see a 0.75 or a 1% drop in this next cycle. And they're not going to do that. It's going to be either a quarter point or a half point because they don't want to stoke inflation again, because that's just going to move people. Um, it's just going to make housing more unaffordable again. And so, right. So, so like we say, it's a $300,000 cost to build a, for a new, a new home. This is a new starter home out, let's say Roy city, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a hundred thousand dollars. It's three hundred thousand. So you three times earning. So you need to family income. Husband and wife need to make about a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Roughly. Yeah. About in that. order to afford a three hundred thousand dollar home. So let's say they each make fifty thousand dollars a year to buy boat with two incomes. So, but we can't bring down that house price anymore because the cost to build it is high and higher and you in these houses the replacement cost for some of our five hundred thousand seven hundred thousand dollar houses i mean if you have to buy homeowners insurance right the replacement cost on that you can't replace it at 500 you can't replace 600 700 the replacement cost is what 900 yeah and, and that's what makes the housing market so difficult is all the intricacies that are involved because it's not just from the house standpoint it's what's the cost of materials what's the concrete cost what's the lumber cost what about the copper wiring labor. the appliances yeah the cost of labor is there a labor shortage um there are so many factors and in that and in industries that are sustaining the housing market as well as the housing market creating that demand for those industries it's not a simple fix as saying um we need to build more houses because then you're going to tap into there's so many pieces that have to fall in place um and i wish it was a simple i mean i know a lot of people keep saying we just need to build more houses but that's going to create additional demand on 
the supplies to build those. And what happens whenever your demand now exceeds your supply? Well, you get inflation there. The prices go up. And so then it increases the cost of housing even further. Um, so it, it really is a catch-22. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really don't know the best answer. Uh, but The interest rate won't fix it. Re we can't reduce the price. We can't, like, if we reduce our, if we increase wages for folks, it becomes, it, it dominoes effects there. And some people, that's their, if we, some people don't bring that much value to the workplace to be able to increase their mm -hmm. wages. That's, I'm not saying that to be. No, um, yeah. There's, there's a reason right? that we get paid to do a job and that's because we have an expertise. And so the lesser expertise, then the less you yeah. get paid. So, and, and I'm, I'm going to let you go because I'm about to go down another rabbit hole. So <laughs> what question did I not ask today that you're like, I don't want you to leave here and say, man, I wish we talked about this. I wish you would have asked me this. I wish you would have opened this up. If there was, so, what is that? So uh, this is one that, uh, and this is one that I've been trying to warn a lot of people of as to what's happening in the industry. And it is a very serious issue. And that is, um, watching out for your consumer in regards to appraisal management companies and the lenders that are using these appraisal management companies, because we have found that a lot of these AMCs may be charging your consumer $680, $700 for an appraisal report. But the way that the TRID and RESPA rules are written for, written for disclosure, the AMCs are using that to really push down what they are paying the appraisers and pocket the difference. So we'll see some, we'll see an AMC shop for two weeks to find an appraiser that does a report for $250. And then they keep that difference undisclosed. And um, so that's one thing that I would start, uh, you know, trying to inform your clients to ask the, uh, the their lenders, what AMCs are you using? And, uh, you know, and actually demanding to see the difference. An AMC is an, is an appraisal management company. Yes. And start actually asking to see what they paid the appraiser. Um, because that's, that's the only way that this is going to start unwinding is to expose that. And we've, we have seen a whole lot of what I would say is, um, consumer fraud in that department, because they have done a whole lot of efforts to make it as non-transparent as possible. Um, we've even seen them tell appraisers, remove this out of the appraisal reports. So like the appraiser will say, I was paid this much. And the AMC will basically say, you need to remove that out of the report. And if you don't, well, then they fire the appraiser. Um, and so they, I mean, there's letters to state boards or sorry not to state boards but to state legislators blocking legislation that you know there's uh in oklahoma they tried to get it to where an invoice was delivered with the appraisal report and the appraisal management company lobbyists came through and basically blocked it and said that uh you know the consumers really aren't concerned about being able to see what the appraiser was paid they just want to see the bottom line <laughs> so so, but the reason for that, and tell us why that is important, because, you know, for us, we prefer using our local lender who has a relationship with their management company, who gets to choose the lenders that are in the round robin at with that management company. And we know that those appraisers get paid. We know that they're going to pick up, We they put out the order. We know that appraisal is going to get picked up relatively quickly because there's a, a relationship there. Well, right? that, that's the biggest thing that happened when AMCs got more popular. They've been around for a long, long time and there truly is a place for them. The smaller banks that don't have the manpower to remove the appraisal process from the loan officer. The reason it all came into play is because the loan officers may have been pressuring their appraisers to hit a certain number. Well, that's never going away. Everybody wants us to hit a certain number. It's up to us to keep our integrity and to do a good job. Um, when the appraisal management companies got popular, like Josh said, they did they didn't divulge how much the appraiser is getting. We're seeing we're seeing forty five page reports that they want to pay us half of what we got twenty years ago, 
when the reports were 10 pages long. So what, so I'm going to guess that the a hint that we know as a, as a realtor is if an appraisal doesn't get picked up. They'll blame, it on, they'll blame it on that they can't find anyone to do it. And then you ask their chief compliance officer, how much are you paying them to do it? What are you, right. I got, a, I sent it to Josh. Josh has done some collection of this data. I got one yesterday asking me to do an appraisal for $350 in four days and it's on the waterfront property. And yeah. thankfully I'm not in a position where I have to do that work to feed my family, but people that have to are stretching themselves a little bit too thin. They may not be, they may not be, um, competent in the area. They may not understand water and the differences in water and they'll go through it really fast, but that appraisal management company will probably get $500 and give the appraiser three. But the consumer thinks they paid eight, $900 for an appraiser or $800 for an appraisal. So that's really important is knowing your lenders. I think that you're onto it more and than money. And then when, it, when there's an error in the appraisal, because that appraiser is newer, they need a distract the something like that. Now we have to go through the AMC to figure that out. And well, that becomes and many, yeah. and many just won't. Yeah. yeah. And many just won't. So what are what are some can you name some names of some good ones that are doing it right? That's, I'm not wrong. I'm saying right. Okay. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but let's can we can we just applaud the ones that we can model? Um being that if not, I, it's fine. Just say no. Yeah, being being that I do a lot of direct, uh, you know, I would probably say more of your smaller local appraisal right. management companies that are owned by your uh, regional appraisers. Those would be the better ones to go for. Um, you know, your much larger ones that are owned by hedge funds and uh, have a lot of people with interest in them, those are the ones that are going to price gouge consumers. And those are the ones that um, are really not checking and we actually have emails from some of these appraisal management companies that uh, actually say well why does the quality matter if it just passes the check yep. and so that's that's a concern is that they're they're not they don't care about quality anymore which is not fair to the consumer it's not fair to the lender um and we we really as me, I pride myself on the report that I deliver and taking the time to do it properly and the correct analysis to where when it's delivered, there is no issue. You have the information you need and it should be able to go through all the checks with no problem. You know, maybe I've done a typo here and there. That's that's possible. Um, we all make mistakes. Um, it's possible I may have missed a comparable that uh, somebody put into MLS incorrectly and that's happened. <laughs> We've seen, I have missed a comparable where uh, it was marked as um, you know, a townhome when it was actually single family. I don't know why. Um, but, but that's yeah, good. Yeah. An appraisal packet. And do you have a sample appraisal packet? Or is it basically a, a true CMA with notes? Is that just all we really need? Well, and if you have the survey, if you have anything like that, we don't want inspection reports because then we're liable for what the inspector has said. And we that's just kind of out of our wheelhouse, but anything that you think contributes. I will say Appraisal House USA is a Central Texas located appraiser, appraisal management company owned by a guy that's still on, on the boots on the ground. Um, independent appraisal, they call themselves I Appraisal. They're real good and they're kind of boutique appraisal management companies. It's the, it's the nationwide ones that are, that are not good. One thing I try to tell real estate agents is if in Texas, if you have an appraiser coming to a property that you are buying or selling, if they are not members of your local MLS, report it immediately. Report it immediately. If they're not a member of the local MLS, and a clue to that might be what? You can How? Look up, and your MLS, you can look up, and, and, and ours is Matrix, and it's got a, a tab to search by agent. And, I'm listed as an agent. I have to pay brokers mm -hmm. fees for my MLS, but I'm listed as an agent in my MLS. I am a member of my local board and my local MLS. I'm a MLS. Well, with that, look, I'm not looking up every appraiser. No, I'm, 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 I'm just going to be. I'm going to be very honest with you, well, and I, I, I would like to think that I that I would do that. But is there a hint? Like, are they going to call me because they're not going to have? How do they? 
like, I don't even understand how you can be an appraiser without having an MLS access. That's exactly like right. that, that blows me away that that's even like, like that's even possible. Well, that should it's be not. Illegal. in Texas. It's not because we're non-disclosure. That's my point. You don't have to look up every appraiser. Just look up the ones that are appraising the properties you're involved in. The yeah. Transaction. So, and to follow up on this, the reason why we're saying this is because a lot of there's been also an issue with property data collectors identifying themselves as appraisers and they have no license at all um they are basically trained by a lot of these larger appraisal management companies and uh, they will go in basically with their phone they'll scan somebody's property uh, from the inside they'll take photos and they'll make their own decisions on what the uh, quality and condition ratings are they'll and we see it all the time where the information is wrong they'll call a wood floor laminate they'll call uh granite quartz they'll uh they have all this information that's wrong and then these appraisal management companies are trying to do hybrid reports because it's quote unquote faster but realistically it has caused a lot of issues and these individuals don't have e o insurance they don't have any insurance if anything goes wrong so if they enter into a property and they get hurt oh, they can sue the homeowner so i'm a seller mm -hmm. this is out of my control well um in that particular case, uh, you can advise, you know, if, if it's, if they're an unlicensed individual, you can actually deny them access. Um, well, absolutely. But they go through as a, I'm just going to, I'm okay. Yeah. So I'm a listing agent. Mm -hmm. My property is listed through Broker Bay. Mm -hmm. They make an appointment through Broker Bay, which in tech, Technically, you're supposed to be, you have to be a member of the MLS, yep. which and to be a member of the MLS, you have to be a member of the board. I'm just going to guess that in my area, this is a non-issue. I Because I can't imagine how somebody's going to have access to my property because they have to go through Broker Bay or Showing Time or whatever my the showing service is in order to access the property. So, I, but I'm guessing this is a issue in areas that don't use showing services. Yeah, well, is that or where the uh, the listing agent is using a lockbox and they just get called and say, well, here's the code to the lockbox. If you're using like a Supra or something in that regards, it's less of an issue because to have access to those, you have to be a realtor um, or access to the MLS system and pay for that service. Um, so if you're working with investors or just kind of doing that non, so I guess my typical market and my peers' typical market, it's, we're doing it, you know, more of a quote unquote traditional way. But if we're just kind of doing some MLS, we're working with an investor who's going with a I don't know. I'm trying to figure out well, where to contact the seller. The seller Who's might recommend. Well, if, well huh? the AMCs are if they um if they call the seller to get access and they sound legitimate, the seller might let them in. Yeah. So I would say the best thing to say is anytime somebody well, tell our sellers don't let people in and let ever that all showings. Well, my sellers know this, but all showings go through the showing service. Through you, just just through through me. You. they don't need to know about that. Just you need to be aware because there are people that are that are misidentifying themselves that are yeah. coming into their homes. There was a pet, there was a what was the um, felon in one of these? It was a property data collector went in someone's house. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there was a, uh, he was, he'd already been arrested for basically organizing a uh, armed robbery of his own truck. And um, he was waiting to go to prison and somehow he got assigned as a property data collector by an appraisal management company. And uh, it was a VA chief appraiser that brought it to light as to what was happening with that. And Although there's right. been a big push about all these, uh, about yeah. making sure everyone is doing a background check on them now, but we still are having a lot of issues with property data collectors identifying themselves as appraisers to get access to a property when they are not. And so the easiest thing to say is like whoever is uh, calling to get access to the property, ask for their uh, appraisal license number. If they can't give you the appraisal license number, they are not an appraiser. Okay. And, and is it, am I accurate? Am I thinking wrong that if they don't have, they can't access Broker Bay without a license number? It's, I, and I use this as a safeguard for me because that's my tool, right? It's like, hey, Johnny Joe up the street 
can't call our showing service and access the property. Yeah, unless unless they actually hold a, a realtor license, because we have a lot of property data collectors that are uh, realtors as well. Um, and so. Oh, so so a realtor will have a side gig as a data property data collector, and then they'll say, I'm an appraiser or whatever, and go in and da-da-da-da-da. Yep. I was wondering where the loophole was and how they worked around it. Well, yep. Not every market so, has but it. Not every, huh? market, not every market has broker base, so I don't know how far you reach with your program, but not every market has that. Or, showing, or some kind of showing service. It's yeah. a third-party showing service, yeah. which I think you can use in any market. It just might not be as customary. Yeah. I know showing time in a broker bay are pretty consistent in our market. But we have yeah. showing time in our market, and 9 out of 10 listings, they don't use it. So Agents want yeah. to make contact with you. Oh, no. Well, I mean, they still do. I just, yeah. I highly recommend a showing service. I think it elevates your service to your clients. Right. And um, so that you don't have to be 24 seven scheduler. Yeah. And it eleva now, now you can have important conversations like, what are your buyers looking for? Right. Uh, what are your sellers looking for? Let's talk through the terms. Now we're only talking properties. Well, guys, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you like going down like, little deeper and uh and 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 finding some solutions to how we can work together as realtors as appraisers as a team in this industry